So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the BioXL webinars. This will be the BioXL webinar number 57. Today's presenter is Charlotte Dean from the University of Oxford, UK, and she will speak about uh, computationally designing therapeutic antibiotic, antibodies, sorry, combining immune repertoire data and structural information. I, I'm Alessandra Villa, from the Royal Institute of Technology, and I will host this webinar together with Arno Prum from the University of Edinburgh. Today's presenter, Charlotte, is Professor of Structural Bioinformatics at the University of Oxford. She's also Deputy Executive Chair of the Engineering Physics Science Research Council and COVID-19 Res Response Director, UK Research of Innovation. She work on development of novel algorithms and tools and database that are openly available to the community. She has developed a lot of tools that are also used in pipeline of pharma industry for drug discovery. And now I'm, we are, I'm looking forward to listen to her webinar. Hello everybody. And first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to talk about one of the areas of work that we do in my group about trying to computationally design therapeutic antibodies. And I'm going to talk about really, I believe we're in a really important phase of being able to do this, where we have this data source, immune repertoire data, and we have these huge amounts of structural information, and we need to bring these things together to really get the reap the benefits of what's possible to predict and what we can do in terms of computational design for these types of therapies. So first of all, why antibodies? This is much easier for me now than it was a few years ago when I was trying to explain this as almost everybody has heard about antibodies because of what's been happening over the last 18 months. But there are really two sides to thinking about antibodies. One is that they are your main defense against disease. So understanding them is key to understanding you know, our health and how well we can survive. It's been estimated that a typical human can produce more than 10 to the 12 different antibodies. And every one of those can probably bind to something distinct, so a distinct epitope, a distinct site on another protein or a small molecule. And of course, what they do is recognize and bind to potentially harmful molecules and either on their own or inhibiting it with other parts of the immune system, recruit things to get rid of whatever is dangerous. And then if we move across to thinking about them as biotherapeutics, there are lots of different pieces to this. I am sure that lots of you have seen in terms of COVID-19, looking at antibodies and therefore how effective a vaccine is. You know, what is the antibody response? How much of this is remembered within your antibodies? And you can also use it to do things like diagnosing exposure. So one of the best ways to tell if somebody has had COVID is to know what antibodies they have circulating in their system. And then finally, the effective biotherapeutics. Now, why are they such effective biotherapeutics? Well, basically because they work already. In our natural immune system, they target specifically and with high affinity to specific sites, and they can be raised against almost any antigen. So they really are a kind of, you know, if you can get it right, a wonder way of being able to target things. Currently, there's over 100 approved antibody drugs. There's something over 700 that have made it past phase one of clinical trials. It's a huge and growing type of therapeutic. I'm afraid I'm going to do my little primer now to make sure when I do the rest of my kind of discussion about antibodies, everybody is on the same page. So on the kind of left hand side of this slide is a schematic representation of actually what a, the total size of a human antibody kind of looks like. So it actually is made up of four chains, as you can see there, two blue and two pink. The blue chains are called the heavy and the pink ones the light. But the only bit I'm going to talk about today at all is the areas of the top two domains of this called the VL and the VH. So they're the last two domains of this. And the reason for that is it is the CDRs within them. These are complementary determining regions, which is a set of six loops which bind to your target of interest. So that's where the antigen binds. That's what we're interested in. And those six loops are picked out in darker colors in the cartoon representation of the protein on the right hand side. So it's that size of piece that I'm going to kind of run through for the rest of the talk. The other part of this, so that was kind of, this is the shape and structure, is this immune repertoire sequencing, which has become a big part of the data that we now have available. What is now possible is to take a sample, it could be from the blood, it could be from the lymph, from a human or, or some other animal, and then sequence the circulating repertoire of antibodies. 
And you can get snapshots of up to several million antibody sequences. So this is an amazingly rich data source. The kind of caveats I have to put on this is, of course, the theoretical diversity is much, much higher than that. And even the circulating diversity is probably at least two orders of magnitude larger. So even though this sounds like a lot of data, it is still not everything by any stretch. But it allows us to do incredible things. We can look at what's happened pre and post immunization. We can see what's happened. We can see what's different between being human and being a mouse. We have these possibilities. We can start to look at these things. Now, all my work starts from databases, databases of information. And these are our three main databases. Um, the first of these, observed antibody space, is about a collection of that immune repertoire data. It has over one and a half billion antibody sequences in it. So there's an enormous amount of data there. And these go across diverse immune states, organisms. Most of it is human. Quite a lot of the rest is mouse. And then there's some small amounts from other species like rabbits and camels and things. But it also covers things like different diseases or ages. So you can start to do those comparisons. And the thing about OAS and the reason we built it is people are dumping this data out, but actually it comes out as here's some DNA sequence. You need to sort this, clean it, annotate it, translate it and number it so you can actually use it to think about antibodies. So what this database is, is a clean version of what is out there and what you can use. The second database is the structural antibody database, and this is the oldest of our databases. It's a fully automated updating collection of all publicly available antibody structure data. So it contains about five and a half thousand structures at the moment. And the really important thing about this, which I kind of have to emphasize at this point, is the reason we built this, any of you who deal with structural data, you've been to the protein data bank, type the word antibody in, you don't get the antibodies. You get all sorts of things, but not a collection of the antibody structures. And so it's very important, once again, to have this consistent data set that contains as much information as we can. But once again, we have numbered it and cleaned it because that allows us to work with the immune repertoire data and the structural data to use them for things I'll talk about as we go forwards. And then finally, Therasabdab. This is a semi-automatic up, self-updating database of all immunotherapeutic variable domains. So what we're doing here is as people, as companies start saying this is a serious candidate to be an immunotherapeutic, we go and collect that information and we can store that up. So these are sequences as they are released by the World Health Organization. And there's about 700 of those. And we collect everything that is post phase one clinical trials in this. So now to kind of bring all that back to the title, this slide is a representation of a piece of work. It's one of those things that as a, as a group leader, you say something to a student which you think just should be done, but you don't really think there's going to be a massive result from it. It's more a kind of this. We should think about this. We should check this because somebody will ask. So what I said was we've got the therapeutic antibodies. And at this point, we had 242 to look for because we weren't collecting them quite as carefully as we are now. And we had OAS. And at that point, it had about half a billion sequences in it. And I just said, can you see if any of the therapeutics are in OAS? And the answer in my head was no, the therapeutics are these highly engineered antibodies that people have really worked on and struggled to make. The answer actually was yes, they are there. So 54 of these 242 had a perfect CDRH3 match. Now I told you about the six CDRs that make up the binding site. CDRH3 is considered to be the major contributor to binding. And a lot of companies only bother to make mutations in that area. A lot of people only even sequence CDRH3 because they think everything else doesn't matter. But that means I could have found that antibody just by looking in my database. It wasn't that clever from the company to have built it. And lots of the sequences had incredibly high um, sequence identity across all of the main and important regions, as you can see from this. So this suggests that you could use this kind of data, the data that's in OAS, to start hunting for therapeutics, at least as very, very good starting points for them, rather than starting with a blank canvas of there are something like 10 to the 15 sensible antibody sequences, guess which one will bind to your antigen. Why not start within something where it's a much smaller representation of that space, but clearly contains important information for binding? Now, this is what we have built from our databases. I am not going to take you through all of these tools. I'm going to do a very quick whip round of this slide, and then I will tell you a little bit more about a few of them on the way through. So if I start from the top left, the collection of Sphinx, Pears, A-Bodybuilder, Scallop, and in fact, Ablupa are all about building 
good models of antibodies. And there are two characteristics here we have. One is we want to be able to do it very fast. And that's because of that huge amount of data. If I've only got one antibody I'm interested in, doesn't matter if it takes a few hours to build a good model. But if I've got potentially thousands of antibodies I'm interested in, or even one and a half billion, I'd like to be able to build models of them all. And I can only do that if my method is very fast. The second thing that we concentrate on with these is always to have an estimate of error. So if we give you a model, we will also tell you, we think this model is worth using, or we think this model is pretty rubbish, but it's all the information you've got. So choose what you want to do with it. Because actually, if you're building thousands of models, you can choose to ignore half of them and go, I'm not using those models because they're poor. I'll concentrate on the bit where I've got good models going on as well. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the most recent addition to this, which is AbLooper. Then we have AbAngle, which looks at the angles between the um, two domains that make up the antibody. Then Saab Plus, which is a very, very rapid structural annotator. So in reality, we can't yet build models to the level of one and a half billion, but we can certainly annotate structurally to that level. And then TAP, which I will tell you a little bit more about during the talk, which is the therapeutic antibody profiler. This is where we look at the properties other than binding to say whether something would be a good therapeutic. And then across the bottom here, epitope profiling, paratyping and obligacy. These are all methods to try and identify more accurately things that will bind to the same site, but also try and identify things that couldn't be found in any other way. So, so things that look sequence space, very, very different, but I'm going to say they're going to bind to the same spot. And I'll tell you a little bit more about space on the way through. And then we come across to WHOMAB. So this is a tool for humanizing antibodies. So obviously, if I put an antibody into you that is from another species, your current antibodies will react to that and drive it out. So I need to put something in which doesn't create an immune reaction within you. And that's what WhoMab is for. Anarchy is our numbering tool and DLab is our first attempt at virtual screening with antibodies. So the first of the tools I'm going to talk about is WhoMab. So what we want to do here is humanize antibodies. And the important part of this is still many antibody therapeutics are derived from non-human sources, about 50% of those currently in development. And even those which come from human sources, those are often humanized animals with humanized um, immune systems also can need humanization post that because obviously even a humanized immune system doesn't lead to nothing that is non-human. A non-human antibody can give you these potentially harmful immune response. And so it's very important to have make an antibody therapeutic as human as possible. And currently, humanization is carried out experimentally in a largely trial and error process. It's not something that is done in a very kind of, if you like, objective function-based way. So what does HUMAD do? Well, we took uh, what we called a very clean part of the OAS database with no repeats within it, because lots of the sequences are identical within the OAS database as well. So we took 65 million sequences from OAS. We removed all these redundant sequences. We removed anything that was missing residues that might be important for all of this. And we separated them into human and also split by V genes, the different V genes of the um, antibodies and non-human. And we trained a random forest. I have to say, we just started with a random forest because it was the simplest method. We then tested better methods as well, but came back to the random forest because it was the best. And what we wanted to do was we just set a human, non-human classification threshold to maximize the YJ statistic. And perfect performance is one. And the first thing to say, and you can see this from the numbers kind of on the blue side of this, is pretty much all the time, you get it perfectly right. And I want to say this is partly because this is actually not very hard in the sense that my se mouse sequences are different from human sequences, camel sequences are, yeah. But the, the point here was that you can do this. What we also found interesting was there was a, um, an LSTM model that had been published before us, which didn't separate quite as well. And there was also been a model that's been published since, um, which also doesn't separate as well. And I'm sort of surprised the other way around here. I think that this is, I don't want to say a trivial problem, but it's not a hard problem to separate out these sequences. It's the rest of the things that we hope to do with this that I think are more important. So the next question was, well, OK, I've asked you an easy thing. Is this a human sequence? Is this a mouse sequence? Is this is a camel sequence. You find the human ones. What about if I take some known therapeutics? So this is when we tested this on a set of known therapeutics. So these uh, from phases one to three and approved. 
all the way through. And we took sequences that were listed as human, humanized, um, chimeric humanized and chimeric in mouse. So you can kind of see which domains and what has been affected on the pictures on the left hand side. And we see exactly the picture we wanted to see, which is all the human sequences came out as human. So that was good. So these are the human therapeutics. They come out as human, humanized. Quite a lot of them do, but not all of them. So clearly not every, you know, not everything is as human as people might hope it to be in that. In the chimeric, it starts dropping down quite a lot and none of the mouse sequences come out. So we're still feeling, OK, our tool is telling us what we want it to tell us. But this is really where we feel that it actually we can show it's useful. So this is a set of data that was collected on ADAs. So this is anti-drug antibodies. So this is basically people are having an immune reaction to having been given that antibody. And this was a set of sequences where there was information published about this. All we did was we the ADAs were usually split into these three categories, low immunogenicity, medium and high. Yep. And we compared this with our score. So if we just had a really high score, we looked at those where we just had, a, a, you know, the score was very high. So say 0.9. Yeah. And almost all of those have low immunogenicity and a tiny number had medium. If we took a positive score, so this was a score less than 0.9, but greater than what we would set as our human threshold, we barely had anything which showed high immunogenicity. And as soon as we moved to things which, if you like, had a non-human score, you can see we were getting the majority of things that had high immunogenicity and medium immunogenicity. So this means that without having any information around this experimental data, we are starting to be able to tell people sequences which are much more likely to have an immunogenic reaction. We have a correlation with the experimental data. We don't expect some nilinear correlation between our scores and the immunogenicity here. We're actually expecting our cutoff to be the most important thing. So given that, we thought, well, can we turn a sequence human? Because that's obviously what we could do with this. So at the moment, I could just tell you that's a bad sequence. Don't make that one. Yep, but that's not that useful. What if you have a precursor sequence and it has a bad Humab score and I want to move it through to having a good Humab score? So here we took a sequence and the way we do humanization is a very kind of greedy way. We look across the entire sequence and we mutate everything to every other amino acid. We identify the residue that makes the biggest change in score. We make that change and repeat and repeat and repeat until we reach the threshold. Now, the interesting thing about this is, of course, sometimes you make one mutation and then you make two, three, four, and then you reverse the first one you made because there are a lot of interdependencies between positions. And it's obviously computationally can be quite heavy work if the sequence is a long way away from human. But it's obviously a procedure that will maximize your ability to do this and minimize the number of residue changes um, that you would make. So we took 25 therapeutic antibodies where somebody had released the precursor non-human sequence so we could do this properly, we could test on a real data set. And they had carried out their sort of experimental humanization to a humanized sequence. And we just ran Humab to create a humanized sequence. And the first thing that I should say is between well, 77% and 85% of the light chain of mutations suggested are basically identical to those made experimentally. They're either exactly the same residue type or if you like in the same chemical family of residue types. The random overlap there would be 5%. The other thing is that we tend to suggest fewer mutations. So we suggest about 60% of the number of mutations that have been made in the experimental humanization. So suggesting that we've got greater efficiency to, to generate something that is human. The other thing is that we suggest fewer mutations at the VHVL interface. And so the binding properties between the two are more likely to be just, just sort of preserved. So overall, we feel this is really cool because it's basically saying we've got a greater likelihood of preserving antibody structure and function whilst being able to accurately humanize these sequences. So the tool itself, we think it's very accurate at evaluating whether an antibody is human or not. It's some kind of humanness score. It actually has predictive power as to whether an antibody is immunogenic based on experimental data, and it can be used to improve the humanness of the sequence. The second part of this, there I've basically used the power of the sequence data in OAS. What I want to start using now is the power of structural data on top of this. And why do I want to do that? 
Well, this picture here is really a demonstration of why. There's a very, very well-known paradigm that everybody is comfortable in, with in terms of proteins, which is if two things have a very similar sequence, they're going to have a similar structure and a similar function. And there's some variance on, you know, how similar they need to be, but basically we understand that. And that paradigm in terms of antibodies, people talk about it as clonotyping, grouping things together with similar sequences, therefore they'll have similar structures and will have a similar function. These pictures show that that paradigm doesn't always hold. So if I look at the one on the left first, these are two heavy chains worm from two different PDBs. They've got um, the different V genes. So they've come from a different genetic background. Both their V gene and J gene genetically are different. Their CDRH3, so the most important binding loop, shares hardly any sequence identity. That's um, barely above random. And yet the RMSD between those two is one angstrom. So within the limits of kind of the crystallographic, how well I will have solved this. And actually, if I showed you the surface, the same chemistry is pointing out as well. Whereas I can go to the second case here on the left, where I have the same V gene, the same J gene, and very, very similar sequences, but now the structures are very different. Now, the purpose behind this is kind of to say, in order to know if two things are going to have the same function, I need to step beyond just looking at their sequence. I should start saying, well, do they have the same structure as well? Because that would also add a layer of information. And I should say about this that case B is, as far as we can tell, relatively rare. It does exist. And case A is more common. But of course, both of them, once you start talking about billions of sequences, start becoming quite common, as in there are a lot of examples within the data that you can look at. Just to show that this does really make sense in terms of what we're trying to achieve. This was a data set where we, one of the first data sets where we started to try and say what structural shapes are happening within this data set. And the data set was an immune repertoire from somebody who had had the flu vaccine, okay? And the flu vaccine is actually made up of the influenza hemagglutinin. That's basically what's in it, okay? And when we do our structural predictions at this point in time, I'll show you at the end that we have moved on from this, we did them kind of effectively by mapping them to known structures of antibodies. And what happened was the um, was actually student who did this work came to me and said, I keep getting the same structure for all of the antibodies here. Not all of them in the data set, but a huge number. And so we had a bit of concern that it wasn't running correctly and what we were doing wrong. But we worked through it all, fairly sure we were right. And it turned out that what was happening was more than 7,000 of the sequences in this data set were being mapped to a particular antibody. That antibody was a structure of an antibody in complex with the influenza hemagglutinin. So we were basically identifying a huge number of diverse sequences which structurally shared the same shape, shape as something that we knew bound to the target here. So it's almost like if we'd structurally mapped this, we would have clustered these things together and said, this is actually an important shape and it must, they're all doing roughly the same thing. I'm now going to talk about one of our tools where we start to use those kinds of structural ideas and I'll go to more kind of things that play into them even more. So the first of these is a therapeutic antibody profile, a TAP, which I mentioned at the beginning. So this is based on the idea that therapeutic antibodies, might, they have to do more than just bind to their target. They've also got to be free from developability issues such as poor stability or high levels of aggregation. And any of you who've worked with small molecules might have seen the kind of Lipinski's rule of five. It's the same idea here. We want to guide the selection of antibodies with appropriate biophysical properties. So what we're going to do is sort of completely analogous to what Lipinski did. We're going to look at clinical stage therapeutics and assume that these indicate the allowed values of properties. And we're going to calculate these metrics on models, because, of course, if we're working on potential stuff, we have to, have to compare model with model, because we won't have crystal structures with all the things that are potential therapeutics. And the last thing is that these metrics don't have to correlate with a particular experiment, because they're not about a experimental value for something. They're about a description of what an antibody must look like. One way to think about this is in Lipinski's rule of five, you might talk about how many hydrogen bonds something, hydrogen bond donors, the external of the molecule has. Well, you can't actually measure that that easily in an experiment, but it's very easy to calculate on a computer. And it's a very useful metric to use for these things. So the data set here was a set of structural models. 
We started here with only 137 post phase one clinical stage antibody therapeutics, those are CSTs. We checked how good the models were. There were 56 which had known structures at this point, and the average RMSD was less than Angstrom. I should say antibodies are pretty easy to model, so that's not that much of a surprise. But more importantly, for what we're going to do here, less than 4% of the residues are wrongly annotated, exposed, or buried. The five properties we looked at were CDRH3 or total CDR length, which you can think of relating things like aggregation, flexibility, topology, patches of surface hydrophobicity, so similar things, aggregation, viscosity, patches of positive charge and patches of negative charge, poor expression, polyspecificity, those kinds of things are often related to these, and the structural FE charge symmetry parameter. So that's about how you relate the two sides of the antibody in this way. And the data sets we're going to look at, those 137 post-phase one therapeutic models. We're going to look at, in the background on this, 14,000 human antibody models that we've built as a kind of representative set of what's in OAS. So you can see, do therapeutics look like standard human antibodies? And then a couple of data sets where people have had developability failures. So first of all, looking at our metrics and looking at the therapeutics versus the human antibodies. I think the picture on the left here isn't really a surprise. Therapeutics really do tend to have shorter CDRH3s. So that's clearly minimizing the amount of flexibility in there, making them easier to work with. So you can see the red graph is quite a long way pushed to the left compared to the models, which are in the blue and green there. You can also look at this with the patches of surface hydrophobicity. Therapeutic antibodies are quite a lot less hydrophobic phobic than a standard human antibody. And once again, I think that's not that surprising because you're talking about a very different formulation between the two. A therapeutic antibody has to be kept in a bottle in a fridge. A human antibody is floating around our system and is in different concentrations with lots of other molecules around it. The patches of, surf of positive charge and negative charge look very similar between therapeutic and human antibodies. These are the distributions we see of this. And the same for the structural symmetry charge. So do these things work? Well, the first question is to test them against things TAP shouldn't flag. So the way we do flagging here is very simple. I say something is an amber flag if it's in the top 5% of the distribution. So what I mean by that is I haven't seen many therapeutics like this before. I give it a red flag if it's outside the distribution. Okay, simple as that. That's kind of the way we're building this. And we took 105 extra post phase one therapeutics that we could collect off beyond the first 137 that we had. And we got eight flags. So we're not gonna flag things very often that are genuine therapeutics, even when we had the distributions that contained that little data. And interestingly, one of them, Irunamab, which was flagged three times, is known for being very, very difficult as a therapeutic and has several properties that make it very difficult to work with. So what we did next was look for things that TAP should flag and can it help to see what would make things better. So these are two different um, antibodies here. And the first one, M1912, was found to aggregate uncontrollably um, during development. And you can see on our um, patches of surface hydrophobicity that it actually just sits way outside the distribution. So I should say the development of this antibody started with M578 and then to improve binding, they generated M1912, which definitely improved binding, but aggregated. It was like an absolute pain. And then with a few mutations, it became M1912 STT. And as you can see, that moved it right back into the distribution and that resolved all of the issues. So that's something that you can just see on this distribution very clearly as these things move. The other case example is here is A001, which had very poor expression levels. Um, so they were unable to work with it in terms of, if you like, generating enough antibody if you were going to use it later on in your experiments. And with some engineering back with some changes, we got to ADDEN, which removed those issues and brought it back into inside the distribution again. The other lovely thing about the TAP guidelines is, of course, because we have Therosabdab and we're collecting these things, they're auto updating. So they just keep getting, if you like, a cleaner and clearer picture of what is happening with therapeutics. 
So the de guidelines today will look slightly different from this, but actually the, it turns out these distributions are not moving very much anymore. They moved a very little bit when we moved kind of from the 138 to the 242 when we added in the extra 107. We're now at 308 on this picture. We're now at nearly 700 for these distributions. And they do move a bit, but basically the endpoints are staying where they are. And if you're central in these distributions, you've definitely got properties that are probably very good for being a standard antibody therapeutic. So next to tell you a little bit about something that I'm sure pretty much everybody has been thinking about and we did a little bit of work on. So in March 2020, we decided to, because of our expertise in these kinds of databases, to collect all of the antibodies that were known, and this is experimentally verified to bind to SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. And this really was just as a resource so that you, know, that you could have all this information because we had the tools that were relatively easily available to us to start trying to collect this as easily as possible. And we actually decided to use this to do something called epitope profiling. And really, this is because it's the first large scale database we've had of this type where we could start to examine our structure based methods. So epitope profiling is one of the things you want to know when you have an antibody is where on the pathogen it binds. So you want to know where its epitope is, what site it binds on. And here is just a picture of the SARS-CoV-2 spike receptor binding domain. And you can see these are some of the main mutants that are involved in the different variants that people have been talking about. A neutralizing antibody that binds wild type SARS-CoV-2 there is not likely to bind to the variants as well, because, of course, the residues have changed in that site. But a neutralizing antibody that bound, if you like, on the other side would be more likely to keep going. So epitope profiling allows you to gain an understanding of which binding modes belong for which kind of B cells, and you can evaluate all sorts of other pieces if you know this information. Now, this is to demonstrate you could do this if you had solved structures of everything. It's lovely to have solved structures of everything, but unfortunately, as I'm sure you're all aware, that's not normally where we sit. Fortunately, in the world of the COVID antibodies, it was enough data that we could start to show what was possible if you did have solved structures and then talk about what you could do with models. So this is an example. There are 22 different antibodies on this picture, and that's the SARS-CoV-2 spike um, RBD again in pink there. And they all bind to the same site, as you can see. It's pretty clear they're all binding in one place. So they're all binding to the same epitope. But the CDRH3 sequences of these are given kind of in the middle of the slide here. And they're very variable. Those black lines that I put in there separate them out into what the clonotypes. So these sequences would have been separated out into multiple different clonotypes if we'd only have their sequences. And there is no way we would have been able to identify from sequence alone that these all bound to the same site. But they obviously do once we have the structures. So how do we get round and past that? Because this is the information we would like to have. So we're going to use modeling to do that because we know that these antibodies from these different lineages with different sequences can engage the same epitope with near identical binding. And if we knew what their structures were, we'd have a better chance of working out that that was the case. So the input data is a large set of antibodies known to bind to a single antigen, some with known epitopes. And then we're going to model them and cluster them and see if that correctly identifies what binds to what. Now we show this all on the COV ABDAB data, but actually you could do it on anything where you have a large data of a set of antibodies known to bind to a single antigen. Yep, because it's, it's completely agnostic about that. It's just within this data set, we are able to show all of this and it is all publicly available. And this is really just to emphasize why you have to do the modeling step. So this is basically the data running from March 2020 to March 2021, which is when we did this analysis. So we're doing the analysis on kind of on the right hand end of these graphs. And if you look at the graph on the left there about um, antibodies, you can see that even though this is probably a disease that was worked on more than anything else you know, has ever been in terms of trying to solve structures of it and collect data, we still only had about 113 structures of over 2000 entries. 
And I can tell you now that though this has grown significantly, so the number of entries in Cov Abdab now, I think is about four and a half thousand, but the numbers of structures has grown at approximately the same rate. So it's about 200 structures. So you're not closing that gap. And I don't think you're likely to, because it's much more expensive to collect structural than sequence data. So modeling is going to be the step you will need if you want to rapidly identify whether these things have similar shapes and might do the same things. So what do we do? Well, we took the 2063 um, coronavirus binding antibody sequences that are in Covabdab in March 21. We used our modeling tool, a body builder. About 75% of the things we thought we modeled accurately. So I go back to what I said when I was talking about my tools. One of the important things is we give an estimate of accuracy. 25% of these things we declared, those models are just not good enough. There's no point in putting them in, there'll be noise. So we took what we could model, and then we did structural clustering based on this. So we would say this is a distinct structure, and we'd say which things had sequences that fell within this. Yep. What we ended up with were 200 multiple occupancy distinct structure clusters. So you had quite a lot of things that were singletons, they had no mates, so we couldn't say anything about them, except they were unlikely to be the same as the things that we did have. Um, and of those clusters, given the data that we had in the database, 92% were entirely consistent in the sense that they were binding to identical things. So we had a method that is 92% accurate identifying if things will bind to the same epitope. And it's a very simple method for being able to do that. And then when we looked at the ones that were um, incorrect, you could basically put them into two categories. So these were 16 cases and they split um, almost evenly into the two categories. One category was the kind of models we suspected were actually not very good and were causing us to cluster things together that might be wrong. So that we'd modeled incorrectly. The other case was actually there's quite a lot of experimental uncertainty about some of the measurements of where things bind. And some of them we would have, it binds here, and that would be the top case, but it also binds here. And the second case would be the one that would agree with our um, clustering. And so we suspect that some of the misclassifications are related to experimental uncertainty as well. So, this ability to predict structures, to predict epitopes, it allows you to do two things very easily. You can functionally characterize less well-known antibodies just by seeing that they are in the same shape as ones you do know really well. So here we've got another set of antibodies where we know where one of these binds, and then we've built models of the others. They share almost exactly the same shape, but their sequences are different. But if we go and, if you like, dock them into that place, we can see that their binding sites are really similar. So you really are able to characterize antibodies that you wouldn't be able to characterize from sequence alone. If you just looked at sequences, you would say, I don't know what this does. But by predicting its structure, you're able to do that. The other really cool thing about this is, of course, if you get a cluster where you don't have any annotation, one experiment tells you everything about that cluster. So you can run one experiment and suddenly 10, 15 things, you have an idea of where they bind. And so it reduces your need for experiments. You can do far fewer in order to get similar or much larger amounts of information. The other exciting thing it does is you can functionally link across species here. Because of course you can't do that in standard clonotype. And it's very difficult to do from sequence similarity because mice are different from humans. But here we've got three antibodies, two are from mice, one is from humans. They are very sequence dissimilar because they come from distinct germlines, but they have very high structural similarity. And this allows us to understand which coronavirus binding sites are targetable by different genetic loci. So mice and humans target the same area on the coronavirus, and it allows us to compare the immune functions of different organisms, something that's been always been very, very difficult in a sequence-based world. We've called this method space because I like nice names, makes me happy. But it has, as I say, this very high accuracy. It functionally allows us to link antibodies with distinct genetic lineages, species origins, coronavirus specificities. It's really interesting, I think, because greater convergence appears to exist in the immune responses than would be suggested by sequence-based approaches. So actually, we are doing more similar um, responses than we think or than we had previously thought. And it allows us to make these kind of high confidence relationships. And I think it will be really useful, not just for kind of early stage drug discovery, because you can also think about, um, you know, if I've 
got a whole load of antibodies that potentially bind to a site I'm interested in. I can pick the ones using TAP, which are most likely to be most developable because they're quite different in sequence, but they all bind where I want to go. But it's also for things like epitope immunodominance. So which epitopes is, are everything binding to? And that helps with things like vaccine design. So finally, I can't really stop without talking a little bit about Ablupa. And this is kind of running alongside the work that has been done by many others, and I guess most famously by the AlphaFold group from um, DeepMind, about this idea that we can do much better at predicting um, structures than we previously could. So the first thing I will say here, which I'm hoping you have both seen in the papers and talks about AlphaFold is, the AlphaFold group are very open about the fact that one of the classes of proteins they find hardest are antibodies. And it's for a very obvious reason, when they are building their models, the base information they use is a multiple sequence alignment. A multiple sequence alignment of antibodies in their CDRs is sort of meaningless in the terms of evolutionary um, information they're trying to extract from it because of the ways that antibodies do their somatic hypermutation and these tiny mutations making big differences to loop confirmations. So what we wanted to do was see if we could build something that was specific for antibodies to see if that helped and to improve the speed and quality of the structural models. And I should say we started all of this before AlphaFold um, 2 came out um, and we finished it slightly after it came out. So the Ablupa pipeline, the input data is just kind of the antibody with its CDRs cut off. So we'll always be using a model of the antibody and we don't have the CDRs on it because we haven't modeled them yet. So it's the rest of the antibody minus those six loops. And then we put in the sequences. We use equivariant graph neural networks to do this. We actually use five of them um, and each one outputs its own separate loop. And then we average these predictions to create the final prediction. It's an end to end predictor. So you can just use it like that. We found that upon occasion, it can create things which are slightly, if you like, off standard geometry. So we've found that a small energy minimization can be useful. And of course, given that it's one of my tools, it gives an estimate of the accuracy of the prediction. And it also works very fast indeed. So first of all, how does it do? Well, this is to give you an idea across the standard sort of data sets. So this is predicting, and we're just going to look at H3 because that's by far the hardest. Most people are doing very well on the other five loops, but I mean, the results look very similar on the other five loops. I'm claiming nothing better or worse than anyone else there. It just saves time to only show you this one. These are two different benchmarks, the Rosetta antibody benchmark, because some uh, one of the most recent other tools, DPAB, had used this as a test. So we were able to compare to them. And then SABDAB latest structures was basically what was available in SABDAB after we had trained Ablupa, but we don't know what other people have used of that data set in their own training and things. So the first thing is that actually the results are not that different across the methods. Um, so I would say that a bodybuilder, which is using standard homology modeling techniques and certainly when we have done comparisons previously is very similar to everyone else's homology building techniques for these loops is worse but the deep learning methods are all quite similar to one another so deepab um, outperforms us on the sabdab latest structures set but some of those things will, will be have been used within the training of deepab and ablooper is approximately the same on the rosetta antibody benchmark so you might say, well, you know, DPAB's already there. You're not doing much better. Why do you care? Why are you telling us about this? And the reason I'm telling you about this is twofold. This is the first piece, is that we have a very good way of estimating the accuracy of our predictions. So on this picture on the right-hand side is the, how good is the prediction, the RMSD to the crystal structure. And then on the x-axis, is the average RMSD between the five predictions made by Ablupa. And you can see it's a very clear correlation. So it is actually very easy for us to say when we have got a good model and when we have got a bad model. Now we can't, I mean, this is obviously not perfect, but it certainly allows us to rule out all the things which we would consider to be very poor models quite quickly and very easily. And we think you can do better than this, but this is, gives you an idea of the kinds of numbers that we can get here. The other thing is that it's fast. So all of the other methods, we're talking minutes to make a prediction minimum, some of them considerably longer than that, particularly if you're thinking about something like AlphaFold, but DeepAB, same thing. So a bodybuilder is the 
takes 30 seconds. That's considered to be really very quick. Yep. Alpha fold, you're talking a series, you know, several minutes up to about 30 minutes on this is doing it all on the same kind of single um, piece of kit. Deep AB, same kind of time frame. I can predict the CDRs for 100 structures in under five seconds. So once again, I can go straight to my large databases. I can predict the lot. I can know what I've done well, and I can move on with them to do any of these kinds of tests that I would like to do. I am going to stop there. As you can probably tell, I could have gone on and on about every tool that we have in the group, but I had to pick a few for today. So picture of the group should say, I presume this is like for most of you, this is our Christmas party from um, 2020. I'm sort of hoping the one this year will look slightly different, though I have to say it was quite entertaining, but not the way I want to hold Christmas parties most of the time. There's been a huge number of people involved in the work that I have described today. Um, some of them are not in this picture anymore because they're ex-members of the group and lots of current members also. And then I should always remember at the end to say thank you to all the companies listed across the bottom there who and the research councils that pay for all the research that I'm lucky enough to be able to do within my group. So finally just to say if you're interested in any of this everything I've described is up it's free yep so you can go and click on our websites you can get download the databases you can do what you want with it. If you've got sensitive data or you're an academic who wants to run really large batches, please don't do that on our website. We have both a vagrant virtual box and a singularity machine and just get in touch with us and we'll be very happy to share those with you. So thank you very much. And I think it is time for questions now. Okay. Thank you very much, Charlotte. A very interesting insight into the range of tools and databases. It's very impressive, uh, both having built up these databases and tools and also the kind of insights you can get. Um, so we have uh, quite a quite a few questions. We'll see how many we can tackle. Uh, so I will read these out and um, I will let you respond. So the first one is how similar are the models built by your antibody builders compared to more classical structure prediction tools like Modeler, iTasser, Rosetta, etc. So two parts to the answer to that, uh, well, maybe even three. First part is if I take a bodybuilder as is before we built things like our blooper, specific antibody modeling tools like a bodybuilder and there were others rosetta antibody actually exists as well are more accurate on antibodies than the general tools like model or itas or rosetta but all tools were reasonably comparable so i wouldn't have said a bodybuilder was better than rosetta antibody for example um, i think in our paper we say it's slightly better but there's not there's not a great deal in it it's not some kind of big thing and in general antibodies are not that hard to model so tools like modeler would do reasonably well as well once we move on to these more kind of um, you know the the sort of deep learning approaches and particularly the things using the end to end modeling like alphafold we are starting to see a, you know, there's a jump, there's a huge jump in accuracy between something like AlphaFold and Modeler if you're on a, something that you can't homology model easily. And so for many antibody CDRH3s, that's the case. And so something like a bodybuilder with our blooper in it would be significantly better than any of these um, on the difficult parts of the antibody. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question is what kinds of database systems or technologies are actually used uh, in uh, and, and in which of these tools and what kind of data structures or standards are you, do you think are sort of important for this? So that varies between the different databases. So with OAS, we have worked with what's called the AIR standards, where people have been trying to set up standards for doing dealing with that type of data. So dealing with um, sequencing data. So to make sure that you are reproducible. Um, so it's it, there we have set up the whole database in that way. We use very different um, back ends on the different databases because they're very different scales. You need something very different on the back end of something like OAS from something on SABDAB because SABDAB has five and a half thousand entries and is probably not going to reach a million anytime soon, but it has a lot of um, other data for each entry yeah, and a lot of connections out from it, whereas OAS has a huge number of individual entries. So you need to store it in ways that are very compact and it's very difficult to search and you know working out how you can do search space on that but actually the amount of kind of extra information for each entry is very very low and connected out much less because it, you, it's not beneficial to do so so it's a bit difficult to um, <laughs> say which way that jumps you can see how they're all built if you just go and have a look so we 
they're either the codes already available on GitHub or you can just look. Um, so I would suggest go and do that. It depends which one you like. You can find out more about it. Yeah, great. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Uh, next one is, um, can you recommend any bioinformatics tools that would help predict the monoclonal antibodies based only on the antigenic sequence? At the moment, the answer, well, I can give you two answers to that. We have built the only tool that currently exists, which has some chance of doing that, which is the D-Lab tool, which I didn't talk about. Um, but it, I, that is not a very accurate way of doing this. It is incredibly difficult at the moment computationally. Almost all computational tools in this realm start either they're taking antibodies which we already know bind and we're trying to explore where they might bind, or we're taking an antibody that might bind weakly and we're improving that binding. The search space, if you say, well, here's an antigenic sequence. Well, the good bit is now I can turn that into an antigenic structure because alpha fold exists, that's good. But I still, there's a whole series of questions. One is where would you like to bind on that structural surface? Does that matter? But if it's everywhere, then that's an enormous search space question. And then couple that, I've told you the antibody search space is 10 to the 15. So the closest we have is something where you would effectively screen that antigen having specified an epitope site in the same way that you would do virtual screening for a small molecule. So screen it against a batch set of antibodies and hope that you get some large score somewhere. But those methods, so DLAB is really the only method that does that from anybody, are not accurate. So I wouldn't be using it to do that in that kind of, that extreme a way yet. I think that's coming, but doesn't exist. Great, thank you. I'm sure it's very useful to the person who asked the question. So uh, next question is, have you run any in vitro validation of UMAP? So this is one of those questions which I have to answer with the, you have to take my word for this. As was probably clear from my previous slide, I, I work with a huge number of companies. So lots of those companies have this code in-house. So the answer to this question is, yes, other people have, but no, I can't tell you what happened. And then I feel that's a bit kind of like, that's a bit pathetic. So I can tell you that they think it works and it's great, but I wouldn't find that very convincing if I was you either. So no, we haven't run any of that. We have been told by others who have run it and used it and done lots of work with it that they like the results. But that's as far as I can go, I'm afraid. And I feel a bit rubbish, but hopefully you can at least vaguely believe me. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Then there's a question about uh, glycans and glycans and glycolization patterns can strongly affect, affect the binding affinity and binding modes of antibodies. Yet these have proven very challenging to include in models. Could you comment on the challenges and progresses in that area? So I would say hardly any progress in that area. It's sort of a known problem in terms of everything I've talked about and almost all the software in this area. And it's something that's usually only picked up once you have some other information to say you've got to deal with it in some way. Um, the reason I think the, the challenge in this is, of course, there's almost no structural data to work from. So it's very unclear what glycosylation might be happening and what shapes that might do or what it might do to your binding. So I think this is a really challenging question, actually, at the moment. Until there is more data, it's going to be one of those things where everyone's going to go, oh, this is very important. And everyone's going to go, I can't do anything on a computer because even if I wrote something, I wouldn't be able to prove it worked. And it'd be very difficult to write something without some data to kind of test it on, build a model from in that way. So I think this is something that will happen as we start collecting more data around that kind of thing. But at the moment, no, there's, there's basically nothing that sensibly deals with that at all. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to, to space, uh, what would be the experimental validation of predictions? Would it be epitope binning or something else? Yeah, so with um, space, there are two different parts of that. We had epitope binning, that, that was the data that was there, but we also had the crystal structures of lots of these things because of the data set we were working on, so we could actually see. The, the other thing is um, lots of people had done experiments by doing mutations on the ARBD, so they had ways of identifying what position, because everyone was desperate to find this information out. So you had lots of things which said where on the RBD it might bind. So it binds on this side, it binds on that side kind of thing. So you have all those different things. It's interesting because I suspect that epitope binning and space won't ever totally agree with one another. Because in epitope binning, of course, if two antibodies have a similar site but not identical, one will knock the other off. Yep. 
So they would be in the same epitope bin because they interfere with each other's binding. Whereas in space, they probably might be in different categorizations because we would see those as different sites because they're not identical sites. So there are were, there were interesting caveats here. And I think it's, I'm quite excited in the next stages as we try and work out how we can kind of what experiments you really need to show that space is doing what I think it it's doing. I mean, the results so far suggest that's correct, but it is interesting to try and build on that. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for at least one more question, but I'm not sure how much how much time after that. We have a lot of a lot of questions. Clearly, uh, people are very interested. Um, we'll see. Um, so then, I would say at least one more question is uh, somebody makes a comment. Alexander says, uh, "Very nice talk in your in the app looper, a looper, app looper. Does the averaging of the predictions improve the quality, uh, or would single prediction have potentially better qualities? And why not return actually an ensemble?" So. Um... We found that generating five predictions did produce better predictions. It is possible that you could do it with a single one. There are two parts to that. When we do the averaging is when we put a loss one um, function in, and the loss one function is what makes sure that we retain the antibody geometry perfectly. Um, we did originally consider retain, returning the ensemble, and I think if people were really, you know, it's there, you can have it. but. I worry that people will think that that ensemble is an ensemble of five confirmations that are possible for the loop. And we don't think that's the case. I think you'd have to train something a bit different if that's what you want to see, but it might be. So it's worth thinking about. Um, so I guess in our hands, the averaging does seem to improve the quality, but I'm not going to claim that that's a rule. I think that's more exactly how we design the algorithm. So I think it's perfectly possible that a single prediction could have better quality um, thinking about it. And then with the ensemble, I don't think I have an objection to that. We're just slightly worried that we think people might overinterpret it more than anything else. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, then there's a question about anti antigen antibody interaction. Could you comment on this? And for, in particular, AlphaFold2 is doing well on protein protein interaction, but not antigen antibody interaction. Do you have any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think that relates to the, the same things that I've spoken about before. So I think its ability to model antibodies is somewhat hamstrung just by the entire way it's built. So antibodies have a very particular mechanism with their somatic hypermutations and their changes and their, the structural importance of those residues um, at the binding site. That means a method like AlphaFold is struggling to do that. I think there is also, you know, other people have published this kind of thing. We've commented on a bit, but other people have published better papers on this, that actually the binding sites between antibodies and their antigens are somewhat different in their residue composition than those between sort of general protein-protein interactions. Um, obviously, it's not different on the antigen side, because it's a protein surface. It's the antibody side with the a greater use of... Um, uh, things like tryptophans and serines and things like that. So it's a slightly different kind of formation of the binding site. So it could be that it's also related to having, if you like, learn how standard proteins behave and antibodies are actually a special case within that. So I think it's both that they struggle to accurately model the antibody CDRs and that there is, we know that there are specific properties about antibody antigen binding sites that are different in terms of residue usage from standard protein protein. So I suspect it's a combination of those two. But I mean, we found the same thing. So we have been playing with AlphaFold2 and it's a mixture between there was a sigh of relief in the sense that it couldn't do antibodies, but also like a damn, why can't it do antibodies? And then we wouldn't, have, you know, we could just use that and work from it. So I'm not quite sure how I feel, but one of those two or some combination. Okay, great. That's uh, very insightful. So, um, uh, so there's another person saying, thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Um, any comments on whether some of the databases and tools of your group might uh, might be applicable to autoantibodies? That's a really good question. I don't think something we thought about a great deal. I suspect the general answer is yes, but we'd want to think carefully. So in each case, it would be whether it, how it was trained or what we had done with it, that we hadn't biased it to be not useful for that question. So I think I'll just go with a sort of, general yes but i want to be think quite hard before i said specifically on that okay um let's do one last question uh i mean it's it's just great we have even a lot more questions but um in interest of time uh i'm aware so let's let's have one more question uh the question is um do you only consider cdr 
or do you think other regions, for example, tight PPI between the light and heavy chain may also contribute to the antigen binding as it makes the uh, antibody structure stable? So one of the things we do is we consider the entire antibody structure um, for all of this. And I think I agree a lot about considering the binding between the VH and the VL as well, because it has an effect on the orientation between those two chains. And if it's very flexible, that's going to be very different from if it's very static. I mean, the way I always think about it, I'm going to hold this up to the camera because I do this all the time. So if you like, the CDRs are basically where my thumbs are. And if you do this and you're flexible, your entire binding shape is like chain shape. Yep. And if you're static, then it's one shape. So I think there's, you know, Understanding all of that is really key. So we actually build models of the entire antibody always. We have a specific um, method, which I mentioned at the beginning, looking at the orientations between these and how things sit within the expected orientation distributions and considering how much flexibility we, there might be. So I think it, you're exactly right. And there's lots of interesting things there. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so in the interest of time, um, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, thanks to the audience. And thank you for, for, for um, uh, responding to these questions as well. I really appreciate it. Um, then I think we just have a quick view from Alessandra about upcoming BioXL webinars. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the discussion and all attendees for the question. And just I want to announce the next uh, BioXL webinar that will be on uh, Charm Force Field and uh, the, is port to Gromax, and it will be around in two weeks with uh, Justin Lemkul. Thank you all. And now we close this webinar section. Bye.